This is such a short gospel, such a short response of Jesus to this question from this scholar of the law, and yet there's so much packed into it. Even just Jesus' short answer, which is the greatest commandment, there's so much packed into that answer that as he says, the entire law and the prophets depend on it. They hang on it, is the the image in both Greek and Hebrew. And the law and the prophets are just shorthand for talking about the whole Bible. So what Jesus is giving is the greatest commandment of the law, but also a summary of all scripture. And so we could literally spend a lifetime unpacking that. But I'm not gonna do that for you tonight. Not a whole lifetime. In his answer, Jesus strings together two quotes from the Old Testament. The first is from Deuteronomy 6, and it is a formulation of belief, a prayer so important that it's basically the Jewish version of the Our Father, or something extremely familiar to us, or of the Creed, something that sums up our belief. In Hebrew, it's called the Shema, which means listen or hear. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So for this first part, which is the greatest commandment that Jesus puts forward as the answer, He quotes directly from Deuteronomy 6.4. And then he adds another one, and the second is like it. And that's from Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus, first of all, important for us to know, he's not just making these things up. He's saying all of this is contained already in the scriptures. But in placing these two commandments together, he does a very interesting thing. Now think about it. What if somebody had asked you that question? What is the greatest passage in Scripture? Or what was the most powerful prayer that Jesus prayed? Right? Like you could come up with some candidates. Say, take the last one, the prayer one. You could say, oh, well, the Our Father, because that's how he taught us to pray. Or you could say his priestly prayer, the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17. Or you could say his moments of agony in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. Or his moments in agony on the cross. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. It's not an easy question to answer, right? There's multiple options. And so I think it's very interesting first for us just to notice that Jesus didn't have to choose these two passages from the Old Testament to answer what is the greatest commandment. He could have said very easily, given us the first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods besides me. That would have been a really good answer. And then if he'd wanted to add a second one on, he could have picked any of the next, of the the last seven of the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are broken up into love of God and love of neighbor. The first three have to do with love of God. The second seven have to do with love of neighbor. But in choosing these two, one from Deuteronomy, one from Leviticus, we should notice that they're both positive formulations. Whereas the Ten Commandments are set out to regulate us against our sinfulness, they're very much laws. You shall not do this, you shall not do that. In Jesus' summary of the entire scriptures, notice that both are positive. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. There's no upper limit to that. And then you shall love your neighbor as yourself also not really an upper limit. So that flip from negative to positive, that's very 
important for us. I think especially as Americans, we can get uh, a bit fixated on laws. We have like a good legal sense about us, but that can also lead us to saying, what is, what is the minimum, right? How do I fulfill this law? Where is the line that I transgress or fulfill? And in this law, the summary of the whole scriptures that Jesus gives us, there is no upper limit. We can always give more. It's very much like in our gospel last week, what we heard about giving to God what is due to God's and how that is a formulation of the virtue of religion. We've received everything from God and we owe everything back to him. There's no upper limit to loving God with all of our heart and strength and soul. And that's the second thing I want to notice about this formulation, this answer that Jesus gives. In calling on the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God. You see that these three components that he lists, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, that these are intended to summarize the totality of our existence with actually everything we have. We are to love the Lord our God. And there's a fascinating interpretation of that second one, with all your soul, which comes from somebody who, I mean, you could call like basically one of the church fathers of early Judaism, uh, shortly after the time of Jesus and shortly after the time of the apostles. His name is Rabbi Akiva. And there's a really famous story in Judaism anyway, a really famous story about the way he died. So bring yourself back to the end of the first century AD. The temple in Jerusalem had already been destroyed as the result of what was called the Jewish Revolt. And the Romans, led by Vespasian and his son Titus, destroyed Jerusalem, put down the revolt. And then over the, neck, over the period of, say, 60 years after that, there were a series of revolts against the Roman governance of Judah. And Rabbi Akiva, at one point, after the Romans had, in an effort to quell some of these revolts, had actually forbid the Jewish people from gathering to study the Torah, the law, the scriptures. He kept doing it anyway. And somebody asked him, like, why are you doing this? You're putting yourself in danger. And then he told them this little story, which I think is fascinating. He said, let me tell you a parable. A fox was walking down by the river, and it saw a bunch of fish swimming away, and it asked the fish, what are you swimming away from? Why are you afraid? And the fish said, there are people with nets trying to gather us up, so we're swimming away. And the fox, being a fox and liking to eat fish, tried to trick them to come out on the land and said, bear with me, I know it's kind of silly, but I think it's really interesting. The fox said to the fish, well, why don't you come out here with me? That'll be safer. They can't get you with the nets. And the fish said, fox, you're supposed to be so sly and clever among all the animals, but don't you know that the water is our very life and that when we're afraid to go from a place where we find and draw our life out into a place even further away from that to an unknown environment is exactly the wrong move. If we're afraid, we need to double down into this place where we draw our life. And so Rabbi Akiva said, that's why I'm studying the Torah, even though it's forbidden. It's because it's from the scriptures that I draw my life. 
I think it's an interesting story because we're in, you know, 2020 has been rough and we have all sorts of different reactions to the different challenges that face us. And I think just for quick self-examination, how often do we turn back to the Lord who is the source of life itself? Do we turn back to the study of his word, to prayer and adoration and worship to the sacraments? How often is that our first move when faced with a challenging situation or with trouble? It's very easy for us to turn to other things, thinking that those can save us. And in doing that, we're doing the same thing that the Shema in its beautiful formulation was written against, turning to idols to look to save us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God. The Lord is one. He is the one who has rescued you and brought you out of a place of slavery and made you his own. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and so you shall love him with all of your heart and your soul and your strength in response to that incredible love that he has shown to us. The story about Rabbi Akiva actually goes on. That was kind of just part one, but there's no more foxes and fishes. He faced consequences for studying the Torah. Uh, Eventually he was caught and he was tortured and put to death. And in that moment when he was being put to death, he started to recite the Shema, this prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. This was a prayer at the time that like we can say, say the Angelus three times a day or the Our Father three times a day, this was a prayer that in Judaism you would say every morning and every evening. And I take it it was evening. And somebody asked him, how can you pray that at a time like this? And he said, for my entire life, I have wondered at the meaning of with all your soul. That word for soul in Hebrew is nefesh. It also means our life or our life force. He says, I've always interpreted that as when God takes your soul back to himself, and now I have the chance to live that out, to love him with all of my heart and my soul, even in this moment, and my strength. Now I have the moment to fulfill that commandment, he said. And I tell this part of the story Because in any story of any kind of heroic act under duress, we need to look at the preparation for some act like that. It wasn't like this Rabbi Akiva had just all of a sudden decided, you know, I'm going to pray this thing. He had prepared himself by a lifetime of praying every morning and every evening, hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone, and you shall love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He had prayed that every single day for his entire life, and so had acquired this habit of prayer, which made it possible for him, even in the midst of extreme suffering, to turn back to that prayer. We are commanded to love in our gospel. And when we're commanded to love, we should understand exactly what that means. That doesn't mean to feel good about something. It means to choose a sacrificial love in imitation of the love that we see in Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus commands us to lay down our lives for one another, to love in that manner. And the only way for us to be able to fulfill that commandment, whether it be to God or to our neighbor, 
to our community, the only way for us to fulfill that commandment in big moments or in hard moments is to prepare for it by a lifetime of loving in small things, to acquire that habit, to love every morning and every evening, every moment of our lives in every opportunity, and so to clothe ourselves in this habit of divine charity. That's how we acquire the habit and so also the strength to be able to carry out that command when things get hard, when we get confused, when we can barely think or understand what's going on, we go back to what we know best. And in naming this the first and greatest commandment, Jesus is saying that what we, as his followers, should know best is how to love. That brings me to our practice this week. Because in joining together this commandment of love of God and love of neighbor, Jesus shows us that to fulfill this first and greatest commandment includes also the love of our neighbor. It trickles down to our every relationship. And so in looking in our practice this week, what are some small ways that we can begin to acquire or extend this habit of love to other spheres of our life where maybe it has not yet touched? We have to consider the various relationships, the various spheres of relationships that we have in our lives. How do I love God? What are the concrete ways that I love God, that I repay back to him as best I can all that he has given to me? And then extending it, what about my family? What are the concrete ways that I fulfill the fourth commandment to honor my father and mother or to love one's children or one's relatives, even though often they're the most difficult people in our lives to get along with because we're so close. What are the ways I extend this commandment even in small ways to start building up this habit of love and fighting against the selfish pride which seeks to rule inside my own heart. How do I extend it further? How do I show concrete acts of love, even if they are very small, to my neighbors, to my community, to my extended community? If you're watching online, you can find our practice in what's called our Sabbath guide. And that's easily found at stannparish.org. There's a link right there, Sabbath guide. You scroll down and eventually you'll see something that says practice. And we've put a whole bunch of suggestions. If you're here in person, you can pick up a bulletin after mass and we've got it printed in there. Not an exhaustive list, but something to get you started because sometimes formulating these concrete small ways, recognizing those opportunities, is the hardest part. It can be hard to start a new habit. And so we need to encourage each other. We need help. And so as we end this week, our five-week series on community, and we take a look back at the Gospels that have come before and to look forward at how we can grow closer in community. We call to mind these, these words, this, this commandment of Jesus, this positive commandment with no upper limit, that we love God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves.